Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So let us enter his gates with thanksgivings in our hearts and give him praise and thanks for all he has done and continues to do in our lives. So grace to you from, uh, from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Savior. This morning I want to welcome you this morning just to uh, first want to give you welcome to you or to us. We come together to give him thanks and praise. Let's come together and, and we pray together. Most Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for all you continue to do in our lives, Lord. Father, we pray that you forgive us for our sin, for our sinful nature, for the wrongs that we do and we continue to do, Father. And Father, we pray that you continue to open our hearts and minds, Lord, to get to know you even more so we can begin to and walk with you even more. So Father, be with us this morning as we come to your word and to your knowledge, Father. Be with us in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. This morning I want to share with you about a battle that we've been mean, fighting for a long time, which is the battle of our minds. And this is a, a battle that is happening, continues to be happening, that is vicious, that is intent, and is relentless, and is often is very unfair. The reason is because your mind is your greatest asset, and the enemy is trying to destroy our minds. You know, we see often people fighting with, with, with mental illness or many other issues that are related to mental illness. But I this one I want to share with you that whatever gets to your mind will get to you. So a message this morning is how to guard, how to protect, how to strengthen, and how to renew our minds. Because the battle for our minds is founded in sin. And sin is always starts in the mind. So let's come to the Word. Heavenly Father, as we come to your Word, Father, we pray that you open our hearts and minds to receive your message. Help us to understand what your words has for us this morning. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My subject this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. This is the word of the Lord. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And this is the word of the Lord. And we give thanks for the reading of his word. Our job, according to the word, is to destroy strongholds. Now, it's a word that we have been using for a little while as we're sharing in the mornings. And strongholds are things that we are always dealing in our minds. And often, in most cases, are mental strongholds. And this is what the Bible says. These are the arguments. They are opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God. And it says that we need to take control or take the strongholds captive. And as I share, we have spoken about strongholds many times. These are materialism, secularism, worry, depression, anxiety, fear, seeking the approval of others, insecurities, and the list goes on. And there are many, many of these strongholds that are trying to control and, and dictate on how we are to live our lives. And the list is very long. And all of these strongholds are mental strongholds because they begin in the mind. And as we begin to build these strongholds, often they begin to work against the knowledge of God. And the Bible tells us that we need to tear them down. It means we need to fight against them. As we read in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, it says, And take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought take captive to obey Christ. What does that mean? It means that we need to take every thought captive. We, miss, we need to bring every thought under submission and every thought to make be obedient to Christ. So the question we need to ask this morning is, how do I do that? How do we make or we take every thought captive? How do we control the thoughts that come to our minds? How do I take control of my mind? 
I don't know about you, but my mind is often very disobedient. My mind often wanders. My mind is very rebellious. Often wants to go in a different direction. When I think of one thing, my mind wanders about something which is the opposite. When I need to pray, my mind wants to say, I want to play. When I need to ponder, my mind wants to wonder. This is why Paul says in Romans 7, verses 23 and 24, he says, But I see in my members another, lay waging, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. See, Paul was saying that the reason why our mind is, is there's a waging war that's happening in our brains, in our minds, that is trying to control who we are. And the reason why our prayer often becomes ineffective, that is because we don't know how to wage war against the thoughts of our mind. And my job and our job this morning is to equip you for this battle. How to wage war for your mind. How to wage war for your mind. So I want to give you four principles this morning on how to wage war for your mind. The first principle is don't believe everything we think. Don't believe everything that comes to your mind. The reason this happens is because not all, I mean, all of us are not immune to this problem. All of us have thoughts. All of us suffer from the same mental illness, if you want to call it that, because it is a mental illness. And the mental illness is called sin. Sin. All of us has the same problem. And we have thoughts that come to our minds. And we have to make sure that the thoughts that we're receiving are from God to test every thought that comes to our minds. You see, the Bible tests us that gives us examples of what our mind is like. Our mind is confused. Our mind is anxious. Our mind is closed. Our mind is evil. Our mind is restless. It is troubled, depraved, sinful, corrupt. Now, these are just some of the few examples that the Bible uses about our mind. This is why we need to take control of the thoughts that are coming to our mind. Because our mind is broken. Our minds are broken by sin. This is why we need to watch what we think. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and, the, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We have an amazing ability to lie to ourselves, and we do this all the time. See, we need to understand that just because we get a thought, it doesn't mean it's a good thought. You need to understand what our thoughts are believing and what is it that we're acting on. We need to take every thought if the thought is not from God. This is when you need to ask the questions, where is that thought coming from? And question those thoughts. Where is it coming from? Is this a thought that Jesus will want me to have? Or this is something that I'm just thinking. So every thought that we receive, we must not just believe it just because we get a thought. And definitely not act on those thoughts. Because sometimes those thoughts are caused by sin. And all sin begins with a lie. You need to remember that Satan is the father of lies. And if Satan can get to you to, your, to, you to believe in a lie... He can get you to sin. Remember that. If Satan can get you to believe in a lie, he can get you to sin. And each time you sin, you're saying to God, God, I know better than you can. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, we deceive ourselves all the time. We need to say that we often say things like, this generation lacks a sense of authenticity. But we need to be honest with statements like that because I don't think we are any different in that regard. 
You see, authenticity begins by admitting that we are not authentic, or we're not authentic much of the time. You see, all of us make decisions, or we come to conclusions, and those conclusions or decisions could be biased, or could be influenced by external factors, or maybe we lack information, or maybe we only see what we want to see. So this is why we need to be careful about the thoughts that come to our minds. If a thought is negative, or is depressive, or it wants to control you, you must take captive of the thought and pray against the thought and say to the thought, thought that is not from God, and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Make sure that you always be confident to say those things. That thought is not from God, and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Always speak truth, even to your mind. The second point is, guard your mind from garbage. Guard your mind from garbage. This is a term that we all know, which it says garbage in, garbage out. Whatever we put in, the same thing comes out. Proverbs 15, 14, it says, The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. But the mouth of fools feeds on folly. What that means is that, that, that only what's the mind of Christ, the, those that have the mind of Christ, seek knowledge and seek understanding from God. But fools seek from garbage. Thus makes them fools. Maybe that's a slogan we should put in our computers or in our phones or even our televisions. You see, there's some of us out there that have, have more knowledge about the Kardashians or about sports statistics or about celebrities, what they are up to, than having a, war, a clue about the Word of God. And this is where what we put into our minds, what we're seeing, what we're reading, will make us into what we believe eventually, and eventually is believing in a lie. See, the Bible tells us that we need to fill our minds with the things that are good. It means always fill your minds with things that are good. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I, tell, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. So how do you guard your mind against garbage in the world? You know, we often tell our children what to watch or not to watch on television or in the computer, because we don't want them to be influenced by bad things. But to be honest with you, we're not immune to the same problem. What are we watching? What are we seeing? Philippians 4, 6 to 7, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgivings, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that pray about everything. Because when we are in prayer about anything or everything, the peace of God will come upon us. It means you fix on the, your eyes on what is true. It means you fix your thoughts on things of excellence. You pray about everything. You know, one of the things that I often do is I have an ongoing dialogue with God. You know, some people like to kneel and pray, which is good, but I tend to have an ongoing dialogue with God. So if I'm driving, if I'm walking, or even if I'm studying, or even doing whatever I'm doing, I will have an ongoing dialogue with God. Because when I have that ongoing dialogue with God, I'm beginning, I guard my thoughts. I guard, <clears throat> I guard my thoughts from what is right. Because I'm always trying to seek what is right. So again, how do I do that? By meditating. By obeying or giving our thoughts to Christ. By giving our thoughts and our minds to Christ. This is why I often pray that our minds and thoughts be open to his word. That our minds and thoughts are captive to his word. You know, when I was a child, my mother often would make cookies. And as she was making her cookies or the cookies, 
and they will be coming out of the oven. You stand by the kitchen, and you watch the cookies just standing there, and you can smell them. And Mom will say, get away from the cookies. And you will say, Mom, I'm just watching. I'm not going to eat them. I'm just watching. And the more you watch, the more you want them. The more you watch, the more you want them. Before you know it, you're eating them. And this is no different with temptation. This is why we need to resist temptation by removing yourself from the situation. You see, the devil wants you to focus on the things that gives us pleasure. And this is why he wants us to fall. Because when we focus on the things that gives us pleasure, will, co will cause us to fall. But God wants us to refocus on what's that to focus on things that will not cause us to sin, but to focus on Him, which is God. The third point is never stop learning. Never stop learning. You must love knowledge. Now, I always tell my sons, the mind that ceases to learn is a mind that ceases to grow. Let me repeat that again. The mind that ceases to learn is a mind that ceases to grow. You must love to, or you must love to learn. You must love the act of learning. Jesus says that we must learn about him, learn from him. You see, our education, our education did, doesn't stop when we ended up in school or when we finished school. Our education didn't stop there. It only began. Our minds must always be fresh, always learning new things, never ceasing from learning new things. Like learning a new language. Learn new things. Why do we want to do this? You know, I used to have a good friend a rabbi, great friend, I always speak about him, who always told me, Josie, never stop feeding your hippocampus, meaning never stop feeding your brain, never stop learning. And in the last three months of this epidemic, I, even though I have a very, very busy schedule with being a parent, being a tutor for my son in school, I decided, with all my busyness, to take Calculus in university. Calculus, why at this time in my life? Why? It's because I enjoy it. I enjoy learning. I enjoy just learning the new things or learning old things. Some people think, why are you such a nerd? But that's okay. But this is what I enjoy. This is what gives me pleasure learning new things or relearning old things that I learned in the past. I'm always learning from other pastors or learning from business people. I'm always even learning from my own critics. I learn from them because I always, there's something I can learn from someone. And I often tell people, don't tell me that you like my sermons because I'm sure they're great. But tell me how I can improve them. Because when I begin to hear that criticism, I learn. We're never too old to learn. You know, the number one quality of learning is being humble enough to say, I don't know, and I want to learn. We're never too old to continue to learn. It is better to admit that we don't know at all than to pretend that we know it all. Proverbs 18.15, it says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge but the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. The wise seeks knowledge because he listens, and as he listens, he seeks more knowledge, more understanding. Proverbs 10, 14, it says, the wise lay up knowledge. In other words, we need to store up our knowledge. We need to continue to learn. Just because we finish school, it doesn't mean that we stop learning. Continue to pick up books. Continue to learn from him. Because the more that we need to know about God, the more our minds become more full with great things, with good things. Because our mind is precious. Our mind or our knowledge is more precious than money, than gold, and all the riches in this world. What we store in our minds 
the things that we learn. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed by the lack of knowledge. So it is important that we continue to refresh our minds, to learn new things, keep our minds clear from the garbage, and being focused on God, on ungodly things, and to continue to learn from God, to learn new skills. We're never too old to learn. So continue to learn. Continue to apply yourself. I mentioned about my friend, the rabbi. You know, he was in his 90s, mid-90s. And I used to go and meet him once a week to learn Hebrew. And I was learning Hebrew with him for years. And he, even in his mid-90s, he'd be reading these huge medical books, translating them from English to Hebrew, from English to Polish or from Hebrew to Polish and be reading these books and translating them in his mid-90s. Because he always reminded me, Josie, never let your hippocampus stop learning. Never let your mind from stop learning. A mind that ceases to learn is a mind that ceases to grow. Now the fourth point is to let God stretch out your dreams. Let God stretch out your dreams. There's a phrase that says, either go big or go home. You see, God has given us all the ability to dream and to envision things and to make them into reality. Every building that I have ever built began in a dream. And that dream came from the dream and the, and the thoughts, and those were put into a paper or put into a computer. Every great piece of art began in a dream and went from the dream to the canvas of whatever was created. Now, we as a people of God need to become dreamers. You know, every church, every mission, every church plant, they all began with a dream. And nothing happens unless someone starts dreaming. And we need to become great people of God with, gay, with great godly dreams. Proverbs 29:18 it says, "Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint." In other words, when there is no vision, people perish. So we need to always continue to have a vision. Because when it speaks about vision, it speaks about dreams. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, and this is a prayer that I wish that we can begin to pray for us as a church, but also for our young people. It says, Acts 2, 17, it says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. What a great statement. Because we need to begin to dream. So let me ask you a question. What is your dream for the next 10 years? Have you ever written it down? What is your dream for your family? What is your dreams for your spiritual life? What are your dreams like? You see, every dream begins in your mind. And if you just leave it in your mind, it is just a dream. But when you write it down, you take a piece of paper and you take a pen and you write it down, it means that you give it yourself a chance to put that dream into action. You take the dream, you write it down. You meditate on it. You ask God, what is this dream about? And as you begin to believe in that dream, you begin to believe that God has given you something for his glory and for his honor. So the question is, what are your dreams? What are you dreaming about? What are you dreaming for the next 10 years? For yourself, for your family, for your career, for whatever it is. Why is it important to write down your dreams? Because it helps you to give direction to your life, and it gives your life purpose. 
You know, whenever, often I ask my wife the same question, what is your dream? And then I ask the question that she hates when I ask her the, the question is, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about your dream? What, I, what can I do to help you fulfill your dream? How can I work together to build on that dream? You know, we can all, all of us have dreams. And the reason why we have dreams is because it's giving us those dreams so that we can become innovative. Because we must be able to cast vision, not just at church, but also at home, also in our work life, also in our ministries, in whatever we're involved with. There must be a vision that is casted. And all of that begins with a dream. And each generation needs a generation of dreamers. Some of them need to be able to be given the ability to dream. And some of those could be you. What are you dreaming about? What are you dreaming about, about the church? What are you dreaming about the ministry? What are you dreaming about your home? What are you dreaming about those things? The next question, what are you doing about it? You know, Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge because that's what imagination, because what you imagine has no limits. Imagination is more important than knowledge because what you imagine has no limits. Listen, the knowledge, knowledge can take us from point A to point B, but imagination can take us anywhere, anywhere. Imagination is the evidence of knowledge. So what we need today is a new, innovative way, so even on how to reach the world, how to reach the new generation, even as we speak today and as we are getting to you through this medium, it's a different way on how, to re how we are reaching our society, but we have to become innovative on how we do that. It means we have to think smart on how we do things because when we have those dreams, when we have those visions, and we can put them into paper and put them into action, God will honor those dreams and make them come to pass. Why? For the glory of God. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. You know, we can do great and more things that we could ever thought of or that we could ever ask, but it starts with a dream. And a dream can get us into great, even bigger dreams. God wants us to stretch our dreams. Why? For his glory. Let's come to the word to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come together, Father, once again, Father, I pray once again, Father, that you reveal yourself to us even more. Father, we want to bring to you every thought that we have, Lord. And Father, help us to always take the negative thoughts or the evil thoughts to be that are trying to destroy us, Lord. And help us to bind those thoughts in the name of Jesus. But Father, I pray, I pray Father, that you, as we continue to dwell in godly things, continue to open our minds to learn from you even more. Help us to learn from new things. Help us to uh, put our minds to greater things so we continue to grow and learn with our minds, Father. But also I pray, Father, for our dreams. Help us to dream. Help us to dream big. And Father, continue to stretch out our dreams to this fullest. Help us to have visions that, Father, that will help us to reach the world. Help us to have visions, Father, that will allow us, Lord, to go to, to even greater distances than we could ever done before. Help us to have the innovation that we've been praying and asking for, Father, for so many years. Help us, Father, to be the world changers, Father, that you call us to be, Father. Help us, Father, to just allow it for our imagination just to continue to grow in you, Father. So, Father, I give you thanks, Lord, and I praise your holy name. Continue to be with us, Lord. And Father, as I continue to pray, Father, I want to give you thanks for even for as this epidemic, Father, it seems to be getting better. Father, we pray also you continue to protect us, Lord, protect our members and our friends, Lord, and our family members, Father, from the evil one that's trying to destroy us. 
Continue to be with us, Father. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious upon you. The Lord take his face towards you and give you his peace. The Lord be with you.